Hello. We all love this geometry, don't we? And, and I've got three crackers for you today. I've got three results. Um, and they're all surprising. If you haven't met them before, I can pretty, guarantee, pretty well guarantee you'll be surprised by them and delighted. So here are the pictures for them. Um, they have a certain amount in common. Uh, they all start with a general figure, a triangle here, and a quadrilateral here. And then we put some regular figures around the outside, which are squares here and here, and equilateral triangles here. And then some magic happens. Um, and the magic's different in each case. They also have in common that they're relatively recent. Um, it's all basic Euclidean geometry that Euclid himself might have discovered and proved, but um, he didn't. And none of it anybody else for about 2,000 years, because so far as we know, they're, they're all discovered in the last 200 years or so. And the other thing that they have in common is that they're very cute to prove using complex numbers. Um, now, geometry in the complex plane is part of the further mass A-level syllabus in England, uh, but all the examples I've seen in textbooks and the like are as dull as ditch water, really. So I thought it would be uh, fun to prove some really interesting and exciting theorems using that technique. So when we're proving geometry, geometric results in the complex plane, this is really a vector's proof. And um, so we need to, need to learn to think about a complex number as not just a point in the complex plane like that, but also as a vector in the complex plane like that. And of course, when it's a vector, we can move it around and it's still the same vector. And the other thing we need to think about is, so rotating a vector by 90 degrees anti-clockwise um, is the same thing as multiplying the corresponding complex number by i. So if you multiply this number by i, we get i minus two, which is this thing here. And that's that one rotated by 90 degrees. Okay, so that's the toolkit. Um, On to the first result. It's due to um, Erna Bottema, a Dutch mathematician, 20th century. Um, I first met this only very recently. I think it was Vincent Pontoni who tweeted about it a little while ago. I, I can't actually find a reference for it. Um, I've looked through his uh, papers on JSTOR and it doesn't seem to be there. He did publish several books, I dare say it's in one of those. But anyway, let's see what it says. So we start with a general triangle. Um, first of all, we put a couple of squares on the sides like that. And then we join up the, these vertices here. So these are the vertices opposite this common vertex. And then we take the midpoint of that line segment. And then the magic is that if we regard these two points as fixed and move that one around, that P doesn't move. <laughs> is that fun? Um, that's extraordinary. <laughs> Even if we turn the triangle inside out, as it were, so that now the... Um, that the squares are on the inside of the triangles rather than the outside. Uh, whatever we do, it P stays the same. Okay, right. It's quite easy to prove in the complex plane. So because we're regarding these two points as fixed, we can give them the coordinates minus the negative one and one. And this is the general complex number Z. Right, so now this vector here is Z plus one because it's Z minus negative one. So this vector is i times z plus one. And so this point is negative one plus i times z minus one. Over on the other side, well, this is now z minus one, isn't it? z minus one. And now to get this vector here, we have to multiply by negative i um, to rotate clockwise. So that point is um, one minus i times z minus one. Okay, so, um, all right, so those are the two points. And so now uh, we can calculate P, can't we? It's just the average of those two, um, add them up and divide by two. So here we are, it's that one plus that one divided by two. And if you work that out, well, it's I. <laughs> so it's fixed. Um, and in fact, it's not just any old fixed point, obviously, it's, it's the, the vertex of um, a right angle isosceles triangle whose hypotenuse is this, this segment here. Okay, so that's fun, isn't it? Okay, so the next result is due to Henri van Obel, um, a century earlier, roughly, Belgian mathematician. And this time I do have a paper, um, 1878 paper. It's a very interesting paper, actually. Um, and he uses complex numbers for the proof, just as I'm going to, not quite the same proof. He actually proves uh, other results as well, which are quite interesting. Um, so for his theorem, we start with a general quadrilateral. Well, that's an interesting start, isn't it? How many theorems do you know that start with general quadrilateral? Not many, I suspect. 
uh, we put squares around the outside and this time we find the centers of the squares and then we join up opposite pairs like that. And the magic this time is those two line segments are always the same length and always at right angle. Again, even if we turn the triangle and the, the, the quadrilateral inside out, uh, they don't need to meet those two line segments, but they're always the same length and they're always at right angles. Let's set about proving that. So I'll get rid of the red lines for the moment just to declutter the picture. I could call these general points W, X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to call them 2W, 2Y, 2X, 2Y, and 2Z. That just simplifies the algebra a bit. Okay, so this point here now, that's X plus Y, halfway between 2X and 2Y. This point here, this vector here is Y minus X. It's half of 2Y minus 2X. And so this vector here is I times Y minus X. And so this point is x plus y plus i times y minus x. Okay, so now we can do all the other points as well. We just cycle the notation, don't we? x becomes y, y becomes z, and so on. So we get a, b, c, and d. Okay, now put the red lines back in, um, uh, but as vectors this time. And our objective is to prove that this vector as a complex number is i times that one. That will establish it's the same length of the right angles. Okay, so CA, that's that minus that. That's that minus that. Um, and if we collect the terms x, y, and z, we get this as x into one minus i and so on. Okay, BD is the same. Uh, it's that minus that. And again, we can collect the terms and get that. So our objective is to prove that that is i times that. And, and well, it is, look. Um, so if we multiply this by i, we get x times i plus 1. And here we get i minus 1 and so on. That's true. So Van Opel's theorem is true. Then the third one is Napoleon's theorem. Yes, that really is Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, the emperor. Um, that's sort of uh, another half century earlier. Um, he published no mathematics, he wasn't a mathematician, and he probably did discover this theorem. Uh, however, consider this chap, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace. I'm sure you've heard of him, he's a great mathematician, also French, roughly the same era, and he published lots and lots. Uh, he probably didn't discover this theorem either. Uh, either. However, uh, Laplace was, um, Laplace and Napoleon knew each other well. Laplace was Napoleon's examiner at the Ecole Militaire, roughly 20 years his senior. And later on, um, he was his minister for the interior. So um, they obviously knew each other very well and presumably got on well together. Um, he got the sack as minister for the interior, actually he wasn't very good at that, went back to mathematics. It's also known that uh, Napoleon enjoyed discussing mathematics with the great mathematicians of the day, Laplace and Lagrange and people like that. Um, uh, he was a keen amateur mathematician. And so, well, this is a bit of a fantasy really, but maybe they discovered it together. Um, I imagine them sort of sitting down after a day discussing the Ministry of the Interior um, and after dinner over a glass of wine talking about geometric puzzles and maybe they discovered this result. And Laplace was clearly a bit of a toady um, and wouldn't have claimed the result even if he did most of the work. Um, he would have said, oh, well done, your Imperial Highness. What a splendid theorem you've just discovered. Anyway, who knows? Uh, what we do know is this. It, it did, it's about the right time scale. It first appeared in 1820. Um, as a problem in an exam, so far as we know. Uh, and its first reference to being anything to do with Napoleon is 50 years later, getting on for when it is apparently known as Napoleon's theorem. Well, who knows? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Let's see the theorem. Here we go. Uh, so we start with the general triangle, and this time we put equilateral triangles around the outside. We find the centers of them, and we join them up. And the magic this time is that that triangle is equilateral. <laughs> Look at that. Whatever we do with this triangle, we even if we turn it inside out again, it's an equilateral triangle. Well, isn't that fun? Okay, let's prove that. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, again, we start with 2x, 2y, and 2z for these general points. This point is x plus y again. This little vector is y minus x. Now, this vector is not i times that because it's not as long as that, is it? It's actually one over root three times the length of it. That's a bit of standard equilateral triangle geometry. And so um, 
this point is x plus y plus i over root three times y minus x. And so again, we can uh, put all the other ones in uh, just by cycling through the notation, x becomes y, y becomes n and so on. And now I've put the red lines back in, but as, as vectors again, and our objective this time is to show that this vector is that one rotated by 120 degrees. Okay, let's have a go at that. So A uh, is that, uh, we've collected the terms again, and B is that, similar sort of thing. And so the vector BA is um, that minus that, which turns out to be this lot. So let's look at the X term, for example, it's, um, well, there's only an X term here, and there's only a Z term from here. Um, and the Y terms, you find that um, the ones cancel and you get two I over root three. Now we want to rotate this about 120 degrees. Um, and that means we have to multiply it by this complex number here, which is this one, a third of the way around the unit circle. Um, those are its coordinates. Um, and it's a, it's a cube root of unity, isn't it? It's the number which if you, if you cube it, you get one again. So let's multiply that by that. So let's just verify this, the X term. So um, the, uh, the real part is minus a half plus a half and it cancels. And then you can see the rest all work. And that is indeed uh, what we get for AC. The AC is going to be this one, um, again, with the, with the algebra cycle backwards this time. So that becomes Z, that becomes X, and that becomes Y, and there we are. So that's the same as that. So it's true. So there are our three little results. I hope you enjoyed them.